Schäfer, Daniel Schäfer. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you're still not tired from yesterday night. Uh, my talk is going to be on GNU Geeks and uh, what we can learn as Nix from it. I don't want to convince you to use Geeks. Uh, Nix is pretty good, but I think it's useful, useful to know what Geeks is. Uh, so yeah, my topics are going to be what is Geeks, how does it compare to Nix, uh, whether it's any good, uh, if it's compatible with Nix, like if you can use both, and what advantages it has, what we can maybe integrate into Nix. Uh, so who of you has heard of Geeks? Okay, and who's actually used it? Uh, four people, okay. Um, so me and Geeks, why do I talk about Geeks? Um, this summer I finished my bachelor's thesis and then NixCon was announced, so I thought, hey, I know a lot about Nix, I could do a talk but I didn't know what to talk about. And somebody in discourse, they wrote, uh, it would be interesting to know about Geeks. So I thought I could try Geeks and tell you guys about it. <laughs> um, so what is Geeks? It's a functional package manager. It's also a distribution with 100% declarative configuration, which does transactional upgrades and rollbacks and unprivileged package management, so without root you can install packages. This description might seem very familiar to you, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Geeks is not a language, so there's uh, the first difference. Uh, yeah, How do we come from Nix to Geeks? It's basically another implementation of the ideas of Nix and NixOS. So if you read Elko's thesis or if you like the ideas of Nix, then Geeks uh, would appeal to you. But it's not just an implementation of the ideas, it's pretty much a re-implementation of Nix, Nix packages and NixOS. So it's not a black box re-implementation, but uh, with knowing the details. So even as a user of Nix, if you know the commands, everything is going to be really familiar to you. It's going to have different names and the libraries are different, like the standard library they use to configure their packages, but uh, it's very similar. It feels like a re-implementation in just a different language. And to go even further, one part of Geeks, their daemon, is just basically a fork of Nix daemon. But uh, they now modified it a bit and it's incompatible because they have a different build in, so it's not Nix daemon anymore. Yeah, but really what is Geeks? It's, it's really just um, uh, Nix, uh, Nix OS with a different user interface, like different user experience. Uh, the commands, are named differently, uh, the language is different, but it feels like feels like Nix. But still, all principles still apply. Everything you love about Nix is there. Um, but other than we, they're working on uh, herd support because it's a GNU project, and they want it to be the real GNU system. So uh, that's why they call it the GNU system. It should be like the GNU project's ultimate operating system. Yeah, they uh, don't use Nix, they use their own language, uh, Lisp, uh, which is the GNU's, um, yeah, Guile, which is the GNU's Lisp. Um, of course, the bootloader, they don't write in Lisp, um, the kernel, they don't. Um, but then, the init uh, RAMFS, the init RAM disk, they do write in the scheme, in Lisp and Guile, uh, which we do in Bash. And then even there, their PID1, they also write in Lisp. Uh, the Geeks daemon, like I said, is just a fork Nix daemon, but they also want to re-implement it in Guile. Uh, but it's not very important, it's just an implementation detail for them, it doesn't really matter that much, so it's not uh, too much of a near-term goal. Uh, the Geeks command line tools, they're also all written in Guile. And their service configuration also, because also the um, uh, the init daemon, you can configure using Guile. And then their package definitions, they also write in Guile. And uh, other than we, we don't really write it in Nix, we write it in Nix slash shell. Like you all have a lot of bash in the phases. Um, so it's not really pure Nix what we do. 
they write their phases and even their wrappers in Lisp. So here, for example, is the X wrapper. Um, maybe you can understand a bit. Set env, it, send, it sets the environment variable, and then it uh, basically runs X with some configuration and the environment variable. It's not the real one, it's simplified, but just to give you an idea that they really do everything in Lisp. Okay, what kind of Lisp do they write? Uh, you maybe know Lisp from computer science classes, but uh, it's different. They don't use the Lisp, which is based purely on lists, uh, so it's not littered with car, cutter, and all these um, weird functions. Yeah, they in their manual they write, please use appropriate data types, don't do everything with lists. They have attribute sets and records and actually useful types. Um, yeah, because they don't, didn't build their own Lisp, they use the Guile. Uh, they already have a mature language with a huge ecosystem, a debugger, for example, uh, yeah, which is useful if you want to start something from, from new uh, to use something existing to build on top. Uh, yeah, Lisp is also untyped like Nix, but um, their attribute sets, they are like Haskell records. You have to, um, to build them, they must be complete. Uh, in their manual, they require that every top level function has to have a doc string, which is pretty cool, which we don't always have. Uh, and they mandate that their Lisp is written in a purely functional style. The language doesn't mandate it, but their, their, sky, uh, their style guide does. So you could say they also have a purely functional language. Um, yeah, it even has pattern matching. With the Lisp macros, you can do everything. Uh, yeah, and because they have Lisp, they can change their language easily. We are stuck with our language. For example, now we have the RFC 45 where we want to remove the unquoted uh, URL type. Um, but for us, it's really hard to remove because then we break the language and then nobody can use old code if they have the new language implementation. But for them, the language is just a library. Uh, one advantage that I found is that you can really easily find definitions. In Nix packages, I often have the problem, where is this Nix function defined or where is this shell function defined? Um, it's not easy to find, but with Lisp, you can just um, recursively search for the name and grab define, because always define isn't the same line as the name. You can really easily find the definition without much um, structured searching. Just scrapping. Yeah, uh, what's, what things is Geeks focused on? Because it's a GNU project, it's very uh, gnu and fsf -y, so they don't have any proprietary software in there. They also don't have any um, mentions of proprietary software. It's all very uh, strict. So they don't have Firefox, because Firefox uses some um, trademarked uh, images from the Mozilla Foundation. Uh, uh, one other focus they have is to reduce the binary bootstrap. Um, there's the GNU MESS project, and they've achieved to reduce the bootstrap binaries from a size of 250 megabytes to just 120, uh, which maybe we can take some inspiration from and try to reduce our bootstrap. Uh, they're also very much focused on reproducible builds. Uh, so they have integrated into the Geeks build command uh, the rounds um, option to say, I want to build this, com uh, this um, package five times and then check whether all of them are equal. And also Geeks challenge, which if you build something locally, you can challenge a binary cache and then compare whether the outputs are exactly the same. So you don't have to necessarily trust your binary cache, you can challenge it and see whether it's actually trustworthy. And also they seem to focus on science. So their two most, uh, uh, their two best contributors work for the French computer science research institution, INRIA, for high com performance computing. And uh, the other one on medicine and uh, molecular medicine lab in Berlin. And they try to use geeks not just for computer people, but also for um, medicine researchers. Okay, how does it compare to Nix? 
that's what we really care about. We don't want to switch to Geeks. We want to know what is the difference, what can we maybe take. Um, so here's a quick overview of some things I already listed and some new things. Uh, for the daemon, they basically use a Nix daemon, which is a fork language. Uh, we use basically Nix Lachelle, and they just use Guile. Um, they also have a distribution. They don't use systemd, of course, because systemd is bloated and everything. Um, their license, of course, is GPL. Um, they used to use Hydra. Uh, now they built their own thing, which is called Kiras. Um, they got their store at GNU slash store. And uh, interestingly, they don't put their, var var uh, their temporary files also under slash GNU, but uh, under slash var. And interesting is their documentation format isn't a doc book, but tech info, um, which we've had recently some discussion about because doc book is very complex and not easy to contribute to. Uh, many people probably don't know tech info, but it looks like it's easier to learn, at least. Uh, so the GNU Shepherd, their system D replacement, it's not really anything special. It's uh, looks like just another system five in it. Um, yeah, it doesn't have any as much functionality as system D, um, but it's pretty usable. Uh, for the configuration, they don't use Bash or shell scripts, but uh, Lisp configuration. So it's at least I think less uh, prone to breaking. <coughs> And uh, yeah, they don't have all the functionality integrated, but they can use, for example, for socket activation, the inetd daemon. Um, what I noticed is that, or what I was missing, they don't have uh, journal d, but just syslog d. So the cool uh, journal ctl commands don't work for the surfaces. It's harder to find the logs of a particular surface. Um, okay, this is what their operating system configuration looks like, which would be our etc conf nix configuration. Um, which is like an attribute set called operating system, and then there they, they define some uh, attributes like the host name, time zone, locale. Uh, yeah, they can do everything we can bootloader, file system users, and then the install packages and services. But uh, they don't have modules, everything is a service for them, which I'll come back to later. Um, okay, here is some example for the file system. Uh, yeah, the file system is also just uh, an attribute set. Maybe you can recognize it if you ignore the parentheses. Uh, but what they don't do is uh, modules. So they don't have multiple files that just get merged together. Here you explicitly have to combine uh, your file systems. So you have the base file systems, which are PROC and SysFS and things like this. And you have to mention it and then add your own cons your own file systems. So it's explicitly um, explicitly combined. It isn't just merged from somewhere defined in Nix packages. For the services, they do the same. So we append to the base services. They also have predefined desktop services where you have uh, everything you need for a desktop. Um, yeah, there's nothing else you can do. There's no module that you can import that can do just anything. Everything else that you want to do is via a service. So a service is almost equivalent to a module. Um, so if, not, if you can't just merge from anywhere, how do you uh, combine things? For example, the shepherd defines all the services, all the system services. If now, um, If Dbus and UDEV now want to create both a service, they can't modify the shepherd because you can't just merge inside of it. So what they do is uh, extend the services. So Dbus says, I want to extend the shepherd with my own uh, system service configuration. And UDEV does the same. And then shepherd does the logic for combining those. So here, for example, is the Apache service. Uh, what it just defines is its name and uh, the extensions, so which services the sh uh, Apache extends. And Apache, it's also simplified, it's not everything. Um, Apache has some shepherd, team, uh, shepherd service, and yeah, we just say extend the shepherd with our Apache services. And because it also uses some accounts to run those services, 
it extends the account service type. So the account is not really a service, but in NixOS speak, it would be a module. Um, yeah, and then every service that's extendable defines compose and extend. So if you want to define your own uh, Apache uh, virtual server, you extend this configuration. And compose defines how these uh, different extensions are combined. So here concatenate is just, we take them all and put them in a list. And extends, uh, you can define a function, how to take this list and transform it into the Apache configuration. <coughs> so nobody can just come and import a module which arbitrarily redefines Apache. Apache has control over how you can modify it. And this is how you define a package. So it should look very familiar to you. You define the name, p name for us, uh, version, and the source, which you fetch from somewhere, a tarball with the hash. You have a synopsis, a description, homepage, license, and everything. But what they have is, here you don't see um, like uh, make derivation or Python package make derivation. Uh, you have how it's built here in an attribute. So here they say this package is built using the GNU build system. If it was a Python package, it would be Python build system. So it's not, uh, the build system doesn't define the structure of the thing. It's just another attribute inside. So all different packages for different languages, they look the same. They're just modified from the inside. Um, and overriding is also very easy. You just uh, declare another package and inherit from a different package, which just takes all attributes from the other package. And then you can override anything you want. So here we just use GNU TLS with an older version of Guy, and we override the inputs with a different Guy, but uh, we, here we also don't just implicitly merge. We take the inputs of uh, the old GNU TLS, and we delete in that list uh, the GNU TLS that was there and replace it with our own. So everything is very explicit. Yeah, they have lots of builders, so it's, it's very new, but they seem to be very mature already. You can build all of these. Um, they even have Linux module, so you can say Linux module and it automatically defines the environment variables that uh, the Linux build system needs to install the modules into which uh, we don't have, I think. We need to define those ourselves in each new module, which we could do and remove this redundancy. Um, so how they define these different build systems is, uh, this, for example, is Go. They just modify the phases. So everything is the same. Go just, uh, the Go build system just modifies the phases. Um, it does something before the unpack, it deletes the regular GNU bootstrap, Go doesn't have configure, um, some other things, and it replaces the build with Go's own build function and does its own check and install. Uh, yeah, but is Geeks any good? Is it as good as Nix? We know Nix is really good, you can use it for everything, for your laptop, for servers, um, but what about Geeks? Uh, what I noticed when installing was that there's no Nixos generate config. So it doesn't detect what's on your system and build a config from that. Um, but they have a graphical installer. Well, not graphical, but end cursors based. Um, uh, Fish or any different shell works pretty well. In Nix, if you define your user shell or some other shell, um, you have to do some other configuration to build, uh, to make it usable. And also in their Nix shell equivalent, um, and a different shell is launched in the subshell. In Nix, if you have a different shell and you call Nix shell, you're back into bash. But uh, Geeks reads your shell variable and launches that shell inside. Uh, they also have a PS1 indicator, so uh, your command line says in the front that you are actually in a Geeks shell. Um, yeah, there's no rebuild test. So you always have to rebuild switch, um, which usually I always test because I make so many changes and I don't want to litter my bootloader and yeah. 
Um, they don't have user bin env by default, only bin sh, but you can really, really easily configure it. Um, they have no package maintainers. There's an attribute for the package thing to define a maintainer who maintains this package, but uh, they don't really use it. There's six usages of it, and all of them are defined to uh, bug minus geeks slash at gnu.org. Um, okay, some limitations. Uh, what was most, uh, what was the worst for me, they don't, and they cannot put the root file system on LVM. They have uh, encryption support with Lux, but no LVM. Otherwise, I would have installed it on my laptop. But it seems really easy. In Nixos, I think it's just one simple command in the init file system, in the DramaFS. But, uh, yeah, nobody cares. Somebody tried four years ago, but <laughs> didn't go anywhere. Um, also, you cannot build a package or run a system test without compiling all the Geeks modules. And on my system on my laptop, it takes half an hour. So they can't really have out of three system tests. Um, if you import a module, like the, not a uh, system module, but uh, the guile module, and it has a syntax error, for example, a missing, missing parenthesis, it doesn't give you any error, it says module not found, which is not very helpful. <laughs> Um, yeah, they have, like I said, all free software, so the Linux Libre kernel without the drivers, proprietary blobs. So, yeah, if you like, the, if you're full into free software, it might be good for you, but otherwise you would have to define your own packages. Um, compatibility. Yeah, the source is, is not compatible, obviously, because it's a different language, um, but you can't also just take a single package definitions and maybe integrated into Nix because uh, they have a different standard library and everything. It depends on the entire ecosystem. Uh, then the next layer, they have an intermediate representation between source and derivation, a bag. Uh, I haven't looked much into it, but we don't have this. Um, oh, this should say derivation. Oh, not. Ah, okay. I added last minute. Um, yeah, the daemon is not compatible because they renamed some built-ins, so uh, you can't use just their command line tools with our daemon. Doesn't work anymore. Uh, also, the derivation doesn't work because the built-ins, um, yeah, they don't really care about uh, compatibility anymore. Also, they renamed lots of environment variables from Nix to GNU. Um, yeah, just for branding. <laughs> the output, uh, yeah, this is compatible because it's just a file system tree. Um, so maybe we could call geeks from Nix and integrate it that way. Okay, what can we learn from geeks? Um, uh, it's a unique name. It's much easier to search for. If you search for Nix, uh, you mostly find Unix things. For example, the Rust grade, which is called Nix, just, just some Unix things. Uh, and it's also much less funny if you're Dutch or German because nix means nothing, and you can say, uh, what are you doing? Nix, I'm doing nothing. <laughs> uh, yeah, they have a graphical installer, which is, I think, even better than their command line installer. Uh, yeah, we should do that for our new users. Um, well, what they can do is, uh, Geek's environment is their Nix shell equivalent. They can uh, go into uh, Next shell with uh, the dependencies of a program, the build dependencies, and also add some other packages, which next shell you can't do minus a and then minus p something. Uh, they have a snippet thing, so in, when you define a package in the source, you can say, on this source, I want to run some commands. So it's not in the package that you modify the source, but in the source attribute directly. So I think it fits better in the source rather than all of the package. Um, they even have a SE Linux policy, which uh, we've discussed recently, and there's also uh, an RFC. Um, but they say it only works for foreign distros. So we, are, we want to do this. Um, yeah, they already have it. Maybe we can take some inspiration. Uh, they can replace their phases without deleting the hooks, which we can't because they are um, in the shell. 
Um, they can do native compilation for foreign architectures. So they can do cross compilations, but they can also compile for a different architecture um, by putting the compiler inside QMU, which is integrated into their command line, which is really cool. It's slower, but for sometimes might be useful if cross compiling doesn't work. Um, their Nix shell has a minus minus container, so you could you can have a Nix shell inside a container. You can even say, I don't want network in there, I don't want anything. Um, yeah, which is pretty cool. Lots of people ask, lots of newbies ask, um, my Nix shell has all these things for my environment. Why does this happen? I thought Nix shell was pure and completely isolated. With this, it's much more isolated. Um, uh, they can build uh, their system, not just build a VM image out of it, but build a com container, like Nixos rebuild container. Um, Python 3 is already default for them. For us, uh, I think it, it's not. Um, so they're already in 2020 with the Python 2 deprecation. Um, yeah, graph, quickly, I don't have much time. Graphs is basically you can replace a package with a patched one and it rewrites all dependencies without rebuilding them. Um, but yeah, by rewriting all the binaries and everything. Obviously, it only works if the name is exactly the same because they're rewriting the binary. Uh, but it's, yeah, I guess it's cool for some, if you don't want to rebuild everything, if you just want to quickly patch something. Um, what they have is Geeks Pack, so you can um, export a derivation as a tarball. And then you can just, on a different distribution, you can just unpack it and unpack it in slash GNU and you can run it. Uh, you can also export it to Docker or SquashFS. But the problem, the problem here is it has to write to GNU store, so if you're not root, it doesn't work. But they have a relocatable option, um, which just puts it into the namespace, and then you have it under slash GNU slash store. And if you don't have root or no, no namespaces, it uses p root automatically. Um, yeah, what we can learn also is uh, they have lots of translations for the manual and even description of the packages. And their command line, I think, is more integrated and more opinionated. Um, yeah, Elko talked about yesterday that uh, with the Nix2, uh, we have Nix2 with the nice command line, but we also have the other tools. And we should really move those tools into one so we have something integrated. Um, yeah, they have a, an official code formatter, which we have some, but not official. Um, yeah, unified command line. They have Geeks Deploy integrated into the command, like we have NixOps. They have Geeks Lint, which lints the packages, so it tells you, um, uh, it checks the best practices. Um, and they have Geeks Import to import packages from somewhere, so you can say import PyPy, this package, and it creates a Geeks description of this package. They also have Geeks Import Nix. Uh, but it doesn't really work anymore. I think they just don't care. Uh, they also have Geeks Refresh command, which uh, is like our uh, Ryan TM. It checks the upstream of uh, this package and then tells you if there's a new version and also tells you the new, new source code for it. Um, yeah, the lint does even CVE checking, which is really cool. Um, yeah, the food to Nix or to Geeks has lots of things. Uh, the Geeks Refresh can also fetch from many sources. Um, ah, here quickly, Elkum yesterday mentioned some problems about uh, the Nix channel. Like, uh, the channel cannot be a Git repository, you cannot pin a channel, and you, can have, you cannot have inter-channel uh, dependencies. With Geeks, uh, everything of this is possible. So maybe we can look at this and uh, see if, compared to Flakes, uh, yeah, like I said, it's basically the same, just the commands have different names. Uh, yeah, summary, NixOS, uh, Geeks is NixOS with Lisp instead of Nix and Bash. Um, service composition works differently, so more explicit instead of implicit merging. Uh, focus on free software. Um, yeah, just like Nix, it's a small community. Much smaller, but they're dedicated, they really keep it moving. And for me, at least, it was a nice and refreshing break from Nix, like the same ideas, but just in a different way. 
Um, and maybe I think you could all try it. And often people say, learn this language, not just for using this language, but for, for getting the ideas. Thanks. A few quick, quest a few quick questions. Uh, yeah, so I noticed in your Go example, you're completely lacking any kind of dependencies. How do they typically deal with this kind of things for when Geek's import doesn't support the language infrastructure? Uh, they usually define all the language dependencies as their own packages. So uh, you, the Go dependencies you also specify in the inputs. They don't do this, uh, they don't try to do everything. They break up each dependency into one Geeks package. But how? Like, do they do code generation for, for these kind of things? Like, what, what if Geeks input doesn't support a use case? If it doesn't support it, well, it doesn't support it. No more questions? Uh, I wonder if GUIX has some analog uh, to Nix uh, configuration modules which allow to customize packages, like for example, turn uh, on or off some video codec for a browser, uh, similar to <laughs> Gen2 use flags for me. Uh, because uh, I saw its source code and I didn't see anything like that, uh, unlike Nix. Um, you, you can override the package and just say, um, yeah, they don't have overlays, so what our use flags would be is the overlays where you can just modify your, all your Nix packages and replace the package, um, but otherwise, if you just want to install the package in your environment, you can override the package like I showed earlier. So you have to explicitly set these build flags which uh, yes. defines this? Maybe yeah. somebody could define a service which puts this uh, overridden package into your path. So you don't have, not everyone has to do it for themselves, but yes, it is explicit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I was wondering, how do they manage different language ecosystems like Python or Haskell? You mentioned that you can import from Hackage, for example, but how do they structure that and how do they generate existing dependency modeling and stuff? Um, if you do the import, it generates the, the package definition and uh, then it doesn't do it recursively, it doesn't do it for all the dependencies. In this package definition, it just says uh, these are the, if you have Rust package, these are the Rust dependencies. And then for each of those, you have to run uh, Geeks import Rust. Thank you. So you mentioned that half hour compilation time uh, for rebuilding uh, Geeks, I guess. Uh, so, wonder when does that happen? Every time you do a Git update to get the latest geeks? Or um, yes, every time you Git update, you would have to recompile all the modules. Okay. There is an interpreted mode, um, but people told me it's very buggy and I shouldn't use it. Um, with the new Guile version, there's a JIT compiler, so maybe that's better and faster. If anyone's interested, I have a Nixos module which uh, installs Geeks on your system. So <laughs> you don't even have to install it manually. Ah, uh, yeah, there is, a, there is a pull request for, some, for a module, and uh, I'm in the process of improving it. Yeah, so you can use, I'm using Geeks on my on Nixos. 
also. Hey, I, I was wondering if you had any, if you had a look at how their community is organized, if there's any like differences to how the Knicks community is organized, if there's any conferences, how they, if there's any working groups, how they kind of like, yeah, how they work. Yeah, I've got a backup slide here. Um, usually they're always at FOSDEM and do some talks there. And uh, here's how they, are, how they organize themselves. The fo so for code, uh, they host it on Savannah like all GNU projects, um, almost. Uh, contributing, or really anything else they do through mailing lists. So they have a patches, bug, info, development mailing list, and then for everything else, just IRC. Uh, they have some web interfaces for the mailing lists, but they're only read-only, like just too pretty to read it. Um, ah, and uh, before FOSDEM this year, they had the small Geeks Days, um, which is, an unconference, or maybe a small gathering, I don't know. Thank you. import that for Repology anymore because they changed the interface. Okay. Let's take 10 minutes.